Chapter 9 The Minister of the Interior sat at his desk later that morning and stared somberly out of the window into the sunlit circular courtyard beneath. At the far end of the courtyard were the beautifully wrought iron gates, decorated on each half with the coat of arms of the Republic of France, and beyond them the place Beauvau where streams of traffic from the Faubourg Saint Honor and the Avenue de Marigny hooted and swirled around the hips of the policemen directing them from the center of the square from the other two roads that led into the square, the Avenue de Moromenal and the Rue de Sauces, other streams of traffic would emerge on a whistled command from the policemen to cross the square and disappear on their way. He seemed to be playing the five streams of lethal Parisian traffic as a bullfighter. Plays a bull, calmly, with aplomb, with dignity and mastery. M. Roger Frey envied him the ordered simplicity of his task, the assured confidence he brought to it. At the gates of the ministry two other gendarmes watched their colleagues. Virtuosity in the center of the square. They carried submachine guns slung across their backs, and looked out on the world through the wrought iron grill of the double gates, protected from the furor of the world beyond, assured of their monthly salaries, their continuing careers, their places in the warm August sunshine. The minister envied them too, for the uncomplicated simplicity of their lives and ambitions. He heard a page rustle behind him and spun his swivel chair back to face his desk. The man across the desk closed the file and laid it reverently on the desk. Before the minister, the two men eyed each other, the silence broken only by the ticking of the Ormola clock on the mantelpiece opposite the door and the subdued road traffic from the place Bovo. Well, what do you think? Commissaire Jean Ducaret, head of President de Gaulle's personal security corps, was one of the foremost experts in France on all questions of security, and particularly as that subject relates to the protection of a single life against assassination. That was why he held his job, and that was why six known plots to kill the President of France had either failed in execution or been dismantled in preparation up till that date. Roland is right, he said at length. His voice was flat, unemotional, final. He might have been giving his judgment on the probable forthcoming result of a football match. If what he says is true, the plot is of an exceptional danger. The entire filing system of all the security agencies of France, the whole network of agents and infiltrators presently maintained inside the OAS, are all reduced to impotence in the face of a foreigner, an outsider, working completely alone, without contacts or friends, and a professional into the bargain. As Roland puts, it, it is. He flicked over the last page of the Action Service Chief's report and read aloud the most dangerous single conception that one can imagine. Roger Frey ran his fingers through the iron-gray shortcut hair and spun away towards the window again. He was not a man easily ruffled, but he was ruffled. On the morning of August 11th, throughout his many years as a devoted Follower of the cause of Charles de Gaulle he had built up the reputation of a tough man behind the intelligence and urbanity that had brought him to a minister's chair. The brilliant blue eyes that could be warmly attractive or chillingly cold, the virility of the compact chest and shoulders and the handsome, ruthless face that had brought admiring glances from not a few women who enjoy the companionship of men of power, these were not merely props for the electoral platform in Roger Frey. In the old days, when the Gaullists had had to fight for survival against American enmity, British indifference, Girardist ambition, and communist ferocity, he had learned his in fighting the hard way. Somehow they had won. Through, and twice in 18 years the man they followed had returned from exile and repudiation to take the position of supreme power in France. And for 
The past two years the battle had been on again, this time against the very men. Who had twice restored the general to power, the army. Until a few minutes. Before, the minister had thought the last struggle was waning, their enemies once. Again sliding into impotence and helpless wrath. Now he knew it was not over yet. A lean and fanatical colonel in Rome had devised a plan that could still bring the whole edifice tumbling down by organizing the death of a single man. Some countries have institutions of sufficient stability to survive the death of a president or the abdication of a king. As Britain had shown 28 years earlier and America would show before. The year was out. But Roger Frey was well enough aware of the state of the institutions of France in 1963 to have no illusions that the death of his president could only be the prologue to putsch and civil war. Well, he said finally, still looking out into the glaring courtyard, he must be told. The policeman did not answer. It was one of the advantages of being a technician that you did your job and left the top decisions to those who were paid to take them. He did not intend to volunteer to be the one who did the telling. The minister turned back to face him. Bien. Merci, commissaire. Then I shall seek an interview this afternoon and inform the president. The voice was crisp and decisive. A thing had to be done. I need hardly ask you to maintain complete silence on this matter until I have had time to explain the position to the president and he has decided how he wishes this affair to be handled. Commissaire Ducaret rose and left, to return across the square and a hundred yards down the road to the gates of the Elysee Palace. Left to himself the Minister of the Interior spun the buff file round to face him and again read it. Slowly through. He had no doubt Roland's assessment was right, and Ducaret's Concurrence left him no room for manoeuvre. The danger was there, it was serious, it could not be avoided and the president had to know. Reluctantly he threw down a switch on the intercom in front of him and told the plastic grill that immediately buzzed at him, get me a call to the secretary. General of the Elysee. Within a minute the red telephone beside the intercom rang. He lifted it and listened for a second. M. Fockhart, S.I.L. who played. Another pause, then the deceptively soft voice of one of the most powerful men in France came on the line. Roger Frey explained briefly what he wanted and why. As soon as possible, Jacques. Yes, I know you have to check. I'll wait. Please call me back as soon as you can. The call back came within an hour. The appointment was fixed for four that afternoon, as soon as the president had finished his siesta. For a second it crossed the minister's mind to protest that what he had on the blotter in front of him was more important than any siesta, but he stifled the protest. Like everybody in the entourage of the president, he was aware of the inadvisability of crossing the soft-voiced civil servant who had the ear of the president at all times and a private filing system of intimate information about which more was feared than was known. At 20 to 4 that afternoon the jackal emerged from Cunningham's Inn, Curzon Street after one of the most delicious and expensive lunches that the London seafood specialists could provide. It was after all, he mused as he swung into South Audley Street, probably his last lunch in London for some time to come, and he had reason to celebrate. At the same moment a black DS-19 saloon swung out of the gates of the Interior Ministry of France into the place Bovo. The policeman in the center of the square, forewarned by a shout from his colleagues on the iron gates, held up the traffic from all the surrounding streets, then snapped into a salute. A hundred meters down the road the Citroën turned towards the grey stone portico in front of the Elysee Palace. Here too the gendarmes on duty, forewarned, had held up the traffic to give the saloon enough turning room to get 
through the surprisingly narrow archway. The two guards Republic and standing. In front of their sentry boxes on each side of the portico smacked their white gloved hands across the magazines of their rifles in salute, and the minister entered the forecourt of the palace. A chain hanging in a low loop across the inner arch of the gate halted the car. While the duty inspector of the day, one of Ducaret's men, briefly glanced inside the car. He nodded towards the minister, who nodded back. At a gesture from the inspector the chain was let fall to the ground and the citroen crunched over it. Across a hundred feet of ten-colored gravel lay the facade of the palace. Robert, the driver, pulled the car to the right and drove round the courtyard. Anti-clockwise, to deposit his master at the foot of the six granite steps that lead to the entrance. The door was opened by one of the two silver-chained, black frock-coated ushers. The minister stepped down and ran up the steps to be greeted at the plate glass door by the chief usher. They greeted each other formally, and he followed the usher inside. They had to wait for a moment in the vestibule. Beneath the vast chandelier suspended on its long gilded chain from the vaulted ceiling far above while the usher telephoned briefly from the marble table to the left of the door. As he put the phone down, he turned to the minister, smiled briefly, and proceeded at his usual majestic, unhurried pace up the carpeted granite stairs to the left. At the first floor they went down the short wide landing that overlooked the hallway below, and stopped when the usher knocked softly on the door to the left of the landing. There was a muffled reply of entrez from within, the usher smoothly opened the door and stood back to let the minister pass into the salon. De ordinances. As the minister entered the door closed behind him without a sound and the usher made his stately way back down the stairs to the vestibule. From the great south windows on the far side of the salon the sun streamed through, bathing the carpet in warmth. One of the floor-to-ceiling windows was open, and from the palace gardens came the sound of a wood pigeon cooing among the trees. The traffic of the Champs Elysee 500 yards beyond the windows and completely shielded from view by the spreading limes and beaches, magnificent in the foliage of full summer, was simply another murmur. Not even as loud as the pigeon. As usual when he was in the south-facing rooms of the Elysee Palace, M. Frey, a townsman born and bred, could imagine he was in some chateau buried in the heart of the country. The roar of the traffic down. The Faubourg Saint Honor on the other side of the building was just a memory. The president, as he knew, adored the countryside. The ADC of the day was Colonel Tessera. He rose from behind his desk. Monsieur L.E. Ministre. Colonel. M. Frey gestured with his head towards the closed double doors. With the gilt handles on the left-hand side of the salon. I am expected. Of course, M. L. E. Ministre. Tessera crossed the room, knocked briefly on the doors, opened one half of them and stood in the entrance. The Minister of the Interior, Monsieur L. E. President. There was a muffled assent from inside. Tessera stepped back, smiled at the minister, and Roger Frey went past him into Charles de Gaulle's private study. There was nothing about that room, he had always thought, that did not give a clue to the man who had ordered its decoration and furnishings. To the right were the three tall and elegant windows that gave access to the garden like those of the Salon de Ordinances. In the study also one of them was open, and the murmuring of the pigeon, muted as one passed through the door between the two rooms, was heard again coming from the gardens. Somewhere under those limes and beaches quiet men toting automatics with which they could pick the ace out of the ace of spades at twenty paces lurked. But woe betide the one of them who let himself be seen from the windows on the first floor. Around the palace the rage of the man they would fanatically protect if they had to had become legendary in the event that he learned of the measures 
taken for his own protection, or if those measures obtruded on his privacy. This was one of the heaviest crosses Tukaret had to bear, and no one envied him the task of protecting a man for whom all forms of personal protection were an indignity he did not appreciate. To the left, against the wall containing the glass-fronted bookshelves, was a Louis XV table on which reposed a Louis XIV clock. The floor was covered by a Savonnery carpet made in the Royal Carpet Factory at Chalet in 1615. This factory, the president had once explained to him, had been a soap factory before. Its conversion to carpet making, and hence the name that had always applied to the carpets it produced. There was nothing in the room that was not simple, nothing that was not dignified, nothing that was not tasteful, and above all nothing that did not exemplify the grandeur of France. And that, so far as Roger Frey was concerned, included the man behind the desk who now rose to greet him with his usual elaborate courtesy. The minister recalled that Harold King, doyen of British journalists in Paris, and the only contemporary Anglo-Saxon who was a personal friend of Charles de Gaulle, had once remarked to him that in all of his personal mannerisms the President was not from the 20th, but from the 18th century. Every time he had met his master since then Roger Frey had vainly tried to imagine a tall figure in silks and brocades making those same courteous gestures and greetings. He could see the connection, but the image escaped him. Nor could he forget the few occasions when the stately old man, really roused by something that had displeased him, had used barrack room language of such forceful crudity as to leave his entourage or cabinet members stunned and speechless. As the minister well knew, one subject likely to produce such a response was the question of the measures the interior minister, responsible for the security of the institutions of France, of which the president himself was the foremost, felt obliged to take. They had never seen eye to eye on that question, and much of what Frey did in that regard had to be done clandestinely. When he thought of the document he carried in his briefcase and the request he was going to have to make, he almost quaked. Mon cher Frey. The tall charcoal grey suited figure had come round the edge of the great desk, behind which he normally sat, hand outstretched in greeting. Monsieur L.E. President, mess respects. He shook the proffered hand. At least L.E. View seemed to be in a good mood. He found himself ushered to one of the two upright chairs covered in First Empire Beauvais tapestry in front of the desk. Charles de Gaulle, his hostly duty done, returned to his side and sat down, back to the wall. He leaned back, placing the fingertips of both hands on the polished wood in front of him. I am told, my dear Frey, that you wished to see me on a matter of urgency. Well, what have you to say to me? Roger Frey breathed in deeply once and began. He explained briefly and succinctly what had brought him, aware that de Gaulle did not appreciate long-winded oratory except his own, and then only for public speaking. In private he appreciated brevity, as several of his more verbose subordinates had discovered. To their embarrassment. While he talked, the man across the desk from him stiffened perceptibly. Leaning back further and further, seeming to grow all the while, he gazed down. The commanding promontory of his nose at the minister as if an unpleasant substance had been introduced into his study by a hitherto trusted servant. Roger. Frey, however, was aware that at five yards range his face could be no more than a blur to the president, whose short-sightedness he concealed on all public occasions by never wearing glasses except to read speeches. The interior minister finished his monologue, which had lasted barely more than one minute, by mentioning the comments of Roland and Tukaret, and finishing, I have the Roland report in my case. 
Without a word the presidential hand stretched out across the desk. M. Frey. Slid the report out of the briefcase and handed it over. From the top pocket of his jacket Charles de Gaulle took his reading glasses. Put them on, spread the folder on his desk and started to read. The pigeon had. Stopped cooing as if appreciating that this was not the moment. Roger Frey. Stared out at the trees, then at the brass reading lamp on the desk next to the blotter. It was a beautifully turned flambeau de vermel from the restoration. Fitted with an electric light, and in the five years of the presidency it had spent thousands of hours illuminating the documents of state that passed during the night across the blotter over which it stood. General de Gaulle was a quick reader. He finished the Roland report in three minutes folded it carefully on the blotter, crossed his hands over it and asked. Well, my dear Frey, what do you want of me? For the second time Roger Frey took a deep breath and launched into a succinct recitation of the steps he wished to take. Twice he used the phrase in. My judgment, Monsieur L.E. President, it will be necessary if we are to avert this. Menace. In the 33rd second of his discourse he used the phrase the interest of France. It was as far as he got. The president cut across him, the sonorous voice rolling. The word France into that of a deity in a way no other French voice before or since has known how to do. The interest of France, my dear Frey, is that the president of France is not seen to be cowering before the menace of a miserable hireling, and he paused, while the contempt of his unknown assailant hung heavy in the room. Of a foreigner. Roger Frey realized that he had lost. The general did not lose his temper as the interior minister feared he might. He began to speak clearly and precisely, as one who has no intention that his wishes shall be in any way unclear to his listener. As he spoke some of the phrases drifted through the window and were heard by Colonel Tessera. La France ne saurait accepter. La dignite et la grandeur sujettes auxiliary. Miserable menaces Dion. Dion Chickal. Two minutes later Roger Frey left the president's presence. He nodded soberly. At Colonel Tessera, walked out through the door of the Salon d'Ordonances. And down the stairs to the vestibule. There, thought the chief usher as he escorted the minister down the stone steps to the waiting citroen and watched him drive away goes a man with one hell of a problem if i ever saw one wonder what the old man had to say to him but being the chief usher his face retained the immobile calm of the facade of the palace he had served for 20 years no it cannot be done that way the president was absolutely formal on that point. Roger Frey turned from the window of his office and surveyed the man to whom he had addressed the remark. Within minutes of returning from the Elysee, he had summoned his chef de cabinet, or chief of personal staff. Alexander Sanguinetti was a Corsican. As the man to whom the interior minister had Delegated over the past two years much of the detailed work of masterminding. The French state security forces, Sanguinetti had established a renown and a reputation that varied widely according to the beholder's personal political affiliations or concept of civil rights. By the extreme left he was hated and feared for his unhesitating mobilization of the CRS anti-riot squads and the no-nonsense tactics these 45,000 paramilitary bruisers used when confronted with a street demonstration from either the left or the right. The communists called him a fascist, perhaps because some of his methods of keeping public order were reminiscent of the means used in the workers. Paradises beyond the Iron Curtain. The extreme right, also called fascists by the communists, loathed him equally, quoting the same arguments of the suppression of democracy and civil rights, but more probably because the ruthless efficiency of his public order measures had gone a long way to preventing the complete breakdown of order that would have helped precipitate 
a right-wing coup ostensibly aimed at restoring that very order. And many ordinary people disliked him, because the draconian decrees that stemmed from his office affected them all, with barriers in the streets. Examinations of identity cards at most major road junctions, roadblocks on all main roads, and the much-publicized photographs of young demonstrators being bludgeoned to the ground by the truncheons of the CRS. The press had already dubbed him Monsieur Anti-OAS and, apart from the relatively small gaullist press, reviled him roundly. If the odium of being the most criticized man in France affected him at all, he managed to hide it. The deity of his private religion was ensconced in an office in the Elysee Palace, and within that religion. Alexander Sanguinetti was the head of the Curia. He glowered at the blotter in front of him, on which lay the buff folder containing the Roland report. It's impossible. Impossible. He is impossible. We have to protect his life, but he won't let us. I could have this man, this jackal. But you say we are allowed to take no countermeasures. What do we do? Just wait for him to strike. Just sit around and wait. The minister sighed. He had expected no less from his chef de cabinet, but it still made his task no easier. He seated himself behind his desk again. Alexander, listen. Firstly, the position is that we are not yet absolutely certain that the Roland report is true. It is his own analysis of the ramblings of this. Kowalski, who has since died. Perhaps Roland is wrong. Inquiries in Vienna are still being conducted. I have been in touch with Gibbot and he expects to have the answer by this evening. But one must agree that, at this stage, to launch a nationwide hunt for a foreigner only known to us by a code name is hardly a realistic proposition. To that extent, I must agree with the president. Beyond that, these are his instructions. No, his absolutely formal orders. I repeat them so that there will be no mistake in any of our minds. There is to be no publicity, no nationwide search, no indication to anyone outside a small circle around us that anything is amiss. The president feels that if the secret were out the press would have a field day, the foreign nations would jeer, and any extra security precautions taken by us would be interpreted both here and abroad. As the spectacle of the president of France hiding from a single man, a foreigner, at that. This he will not, I repeat, will not tolerate. In fact, the minister emphasized his point with pointed forefinger. He made quite plain to me that if in our handling of the affair the details, or even the general impression, became public knowledge, heads would roll. Believe me, Sher Ami, I have never seen him so adamant. But the public program, expostulated the Corsican civil servant, it must inevitably be changed. There must be no more public appearances until the man is caught. He must surely. He will cancel nothing. There will be no changes, not by an hour or a minute. The whole thing has got to be done in complete secrecy. For the first time since the dismantlement of the Akal military assassination. Plot in February, with the arrest of the plotters, Alexander Sanguinetti felt he was back where he started. In the past two months, battling against the wave of bank robberies and smash and grab raids, he had permitted himself to hope that the worst was over. With the OAS apparatus crumbling under the twin assaults of the action service from within and the hordes of police and CRS from without, he had interpreted the crime wave as the death throes of the secret army, the last handful of thugs on the rampage trying to acquire enough money to live well in exile. But the last page of Roland's report made plain that the scores of double agents Roland had been able to infiltrate into even the highest ranks of the OAS 
had been outflanked by the anonymity of the assassin, except to three men who were unobtainable in a hotel in Rome, and he could see for himself that the enormous archives of dossiers on everyone who had ever been remotely connected with the OAS, on which the Interior Ministry could usually rely for the information, had been rendered useless by one simple fact. The jackal was a foreigner. If we are not allowed to act, what can we do? I did not say we were not allowed to act, corrected Frey. I said we were not allowed to act publicly. The whole thing must be done secretly. That leaves us only one alternative. The identity of the assassin must be revealed by a secret inquiry, he must be traced wherever he is, in France or abroad, and then destroyed without hesitation. And destroyed without hesitation. That, gentlemen, is the only course left open to us. The interior minister surveyed the meeting seated round the table of the ministry conference room to let the impact of his words sink in. There were 14 men in the room including himself. The minister stood at the head of the table. To his immediate right sat his chef de cabinet, and to his left the prefect of police, the political head of France's police forces. From Sanguinetti's right hand down the length of the oblong table sat General Gibbard, head of the STIS, Colonel Roland, chief of the action service and the author of the report of which a copy lay in front of each man. Beyond Roland were Commissaire Ducaret of the Corps de SECU right presidentially, and Colonel St. Clair de Villa Eubin, an Air Force Colonel of the Elysee staff, a fanatical gaullist but equally renowned in the entourage of the President as being equally fanatical concerning his own ambition. To the left of M. Maurice Papon, the Prefect of Police, were M. Maurice Grimaud, the Director General of France's National Crime Force the Chouret National, and in a row the five heads of the departments that make up the Shurid. Although beloved of novelists as a crime-busting force, the Shurid National itself is simply the very small and meagerly staffed office that has control over the five crime branches that actually do the work. The task of the Shurid is administrative, like that of the equally misdescribed Interpol, and the Shurid does not have a detective on its staff. The man with the National Detective Force of France under his personal orders sat next to Maurice Grimaud. He was Max Fernet, director of the police. Judiciaire. Apart from its enormous headquarters on the Quai de Orfevres, vastly bigger than the Shurid's headquarters at 11 Rue de Sausses, just round the corner from the Interior Ministry, the police judiciaire controls 17. Services Regionaux headquarters, one for each of the 17 police districts of metropolitan France. Under these come the borough police forces, 453 in all, being comprised of 74 central commissariats, 253 constituency commissariats and 126 local posts to police. The whole network ranges through 2,000 towns and villages of France. This is the crime force. In the rural areas and up and down the highways the more general task of maintaining law and order is carried out by the Gendarmerie Nationale and the traffic police, the Gendarmes Mobiles. In many areas, for reasons of efficiency, the Gendarmes and the agents to police share the same accommodation and facilities. The total number of men under Max Furnett's command in the police judiciaire in 1963 was just over 20,000. Running down the table from Furnett's left were the heads of the other four sections of the Shurid, the Bureau de SECU right public, the Renseignements Generaux, the Direction de la Surveillance du Territoire, and the Corps Republicain de SECU right. The first of these, the BSP, was concerned mainly with protection of buildings, communications, highways, and anything else belonging to the state from sabotage or damage. 
The second, the RG or Central Records Office was the memory of the other four, in its Pantheon headquarters archives were four and a half million personal dossiers on individuals who had come to the notice of the police forces of France since those forces were founded. They were cross-indexed along five and a half miles of shelves in categories of the names of the persons to whom they applied, or the type of crime for which the person had been convicted or merely suspected. Names of witnesses who had appeared in cases, or those who had been acquitted, were also listed. Although the system was not at that time computerized, the archivists prided themselves that within a few minutes they could unearth the details of arson committed in a small village ten years back, or the names of witnesses in an obscure trial that had hardly made the newspapers. Added to these dossiers were the fingerprints of everyone who had ever had his fingerprints taken in France, including many sets that had never been identified. There were also ten and a half million cards, including the disembarkation card of every tourist at every border crossing point, and the hotel. Cards filled in by all who stayed at French hotels outside Paris. For reasons of space alone these cards had to be cleared out at fairly short intervals to make way for the vast number of fresh ones that came in each year. The only cards regularly filled in within the area of France that did not go to the RG were those filled in at the hotels of Paris. These went to the Prefecture de Police in the Boulevard du Palais. The DST, whose chief sat three places down from Fernet, was and is the counterespionage force of France, responsible also for maintaining a constant watch on France's airports, docks and borders. Before going to the archives, the disembarkation cards of those entering France are examined by the DST officer at the point of entry, for screening to keep tabs on undesirables. The last man in the row was the chief of the CRS, the 45,000 man, force of which Alexander Sanguinetti had already made such a well-publicized and heartily unpopular use over the previous two years. For reasons of space, the head of the CRS was sitting at the foot of the table, facing down the length of the wood at the minister. There was one last seat remaining, that between the head of the CRS and Colonel St. Clair, at the bottom right-hand corner. It was occupied by a large stolid man whose pipe fumes evidently annoyed the fastidious colonel on his left. The minister had made a point of asking Max Fernet to bring him along to the meeting. He was Commissaire Maurice Bouvier, head of the Brigade Crimiel of the PJ. So that is where we stand, gentlemen, resumed the minister. Now you have. I'll read the report by Colonel Roland which lies in front of each of you. And. Now you have heard from me the considerable limitations which the president, in. The interests of the dignity of France, has felt obliged to impose on our efforts to. Avert this threat to his person. I will stress again, there must be absolute secrecy in the conduct of the investigation and in any subsequent action to be taken. Needless to say, you are all sworn to total silence and will discuss the matter with no one outside this room until and unless another person has been made privy to the secret. I have called you all here because it seems to me that whatever we are to do, the resources of all the departments here represented must sooner or later be called upon, and you, the departmental chiefs, should have no doubt as to the top priority that this affair demands. It must on all occasions require your immediate and personal attention. There will be no delegation to juniors, except for tasks which do not reveal the reason behind the requirement. He paused again. Down both sides of the table some heads nodded soberly. Others kept their eyes fixed on the speaker or on the dossier in front of them. At the far end, Commissaire Bouvier gazed at the ceiling, emitting brief bursts of smoke from the corner of his mouth like a red Indian sending up signals. The air 
force colonel next to him winced at each emission. Now, resumed the minister, I think I may ask for your ideas on the subject. Colonel Roland, have you had any success with your inquiries in Vienna? The head of the action service glanced up from his own report, cast a sideways look at the general who led the STIS, but received neither encouragement nor a frown. General Gibbard, remembering that he had spent half the day sobering down the head of R.3 section over Roland's early morning decision to use the Viennese office for his own inquiries, stared straight ahead of him. Yes, said the colonel. Inquiries were made this morning and afternoon by operatives in Vienna at the Pension Kleist, a small private hotel in the Bruckner Ali. They carried with them photographs of Marc Rodin, René Montclair and André Cassin. There was no time to transmit to them photographs of Viktor Kowalski, which were not on file in Vienna. The desk clerk at the hotel stated that he recognized at least two of the men, but he could not place them. Some money changed hands, and he was asked to search the hotel register for the days between June 12th and 18th, the latter being the day the three OAS chiefs took up residence together in Rome. Eventually he claimed to have remembered the face of Rodin as a man who booked a room in the name of Schultz on June 15th. The clerk said he had a form of business conference in the afternoon, spent the night in that room and left the next day. He remembered that Schultz had had a companion, a very big man with a surly manner, which was why he remembered Schultz. He was visited by two men in the morning and they had a conference. The two visitors could have been Cassin and Montclair. He could not be sure, but he thought he had seen at least one of them before. The clerk said the men remained in their room all day, apart from one occasion. In the late morning when Schultz and the giant, as he called Kowalski, left for half an hour. None of them had any lunch, nor did they come down to eat. Were they visited at all by a fifth man, asked Sanguinetti impatiently. Roland continued his report as before, in flat tones. During the evening another man joined them for half an hour. The clerk said. He remembered because the visitor entered the hotel so quickly and headed straight up the stairs, that the clerk did not get a chance to see him. He thought. He must be one of the guests, who had retained his key. But he saw the tail of the man's coat going up the stairs. A few seconds later the man was back in the hall. The clerk was sure it was the same man because of the coat. The man used the desk phone and asked to be put through to Schultz's room. Number 64. He spoke two sentences in French, then replaced the phone and went back up the stairs. He spent half an hour there, then left without saying another word. About an hour after that, the other two who had visited Schultz left separately. Schultz and the giants stayed for the night, then left after breakfast in the morning. The only description the clerk could give of the evening visitor was, tall, age, uncertain, features apparently regular but he wore wraparound dark glasses, spoke fluent French, and had blonde hair left rather long and swept back from the for it. Is there any chance of getting the man to help make up an identical picture of the blonde, asked the prefect of police, Papon. Roland shook his head. My. Our agents were posing as Viennese plainclothes police. Fortunately. One of them could pass for a Viennese. But that is a masquerade that could not. Be sustained indefinitely. The man had to be interviewed at the hotel desk. We must get a better description than that, protested the head of the records. Office. Was any name mentioned? No, said Roland. What you have just heard is the outcome of three hours. Spent interrogating the clerk. Every point was gone over time and time again. There is nothing else he can remember. Short of an identical picture, that's the best description he could give. 
could you not snatch him like our good, so that he could make up a picture of this assassin here in Paris, queried Colonel St. Clair. The minister interjected. There can be no more snatches. We are still at daggers drawn with the German foreign ministry over the our good snatch. That kind of thing can work once, but not again. Surely in a matter of the seriousness the disappearance of a desk clerk can be done more discreetly than the our good affair, suggested the head of the DST. It is in any case doubtful, said Max Furnett quietly, whether an identicate picture of a man wearing wrap-round dark glasses would be very helpful. Very few identicate pictures made up on the basis of an unremarkable incident lasting 20 seconds two months before ever seemed to look like the criminal when he is eventually caught. Most such pictures could be of half a million people and some are actually misleading. So apart from Kowalski, who is dead, and who told everything he knew, which was not much, there are only four men in the world who know the identity of this jackal, said Commissaire Ducaret. One is the man himself, and the other three are in a hotel in Rome. How about trying to get one of them back here? Again the minister shook his head. My instructions on that are formal. Kidnappings are out. The Italian government would go out of its mind if this kind of thing happened a few yards from the Via Condotti. Besides there are some doubts as to its feasibility. General. General Gibbard lifted his eyes to the assembly. The extent and quality of the protective screen Rodin and his two henchmen have built round themselves, according to the reports of my agents who have them under permanent surveillance, rule this out from the practical standpoint. Also, he said, there are eight top-class ex-Legion gunmen round them, or seven. If Kowalski has not been replaced, all the lifts, stairs, fire escape and roof are guarded. It would involve a major gun battle, probably with gas grenades and submachine guns to get one of them alive. Even then, the chances of getting the man out of the country and 500 kilometers north to France, with the Italians on the rampage would be very slight indeed. We have men who are some of the world's top experts in this kind of thing, and they say it would be just about impossible short of a commando-style military operation. Silence descended on the room again. Well, gentlemen, said the minister, any more suggestions? This jackal must be found. That much is clear, replied Colonel St. Clair. Several of the others round the table glanced at each other and an eyebrow or two was raised. That much certainly is clear, murmured the minister at the head of the table. What we are trying to devise is a way in which that can be done, within the limits imposed upon us and on that basis perhaps we can best decide which of the departments here represented would be best suited for the job. The protection of the President of the Republic, announced St. Clair. Grandiosely, must depend in the last resort when all others have failed on the Presidential Security Corps and the President's personal staff. We, I can assure you, Minister, will do our duty. Some of the hardcore professionals closed their eyes in unfeigned weariness. Commissaire Ducaret shot the colonel a glance which, if looks could kill, would have dropped St. Clair in his tracks. Doesn't he know the old man's not listening, growled Gibbot under his breath to Roland. Roger Frey raised his eyes to meet those of the Elysee Palace courtier and demonstrated why he was a minister. The Colonel St. Clair is perfectly right, of course, he purred. We shall all do our duty. And I am sure it has occurred to the Colonel that should a certain department undertake the responsibility for the destruction of this plot, and fail to achieve it, or even employ methods inadvertently capable of bringing publicity contrary to the wishes of the President, certain disapprobation would inevitably descend upon the head of him who had failed. The menace hung above the long table more tangible than the pall of blue. 
Smoke from Bouvier's pipe. St. Clair's thin pale face tightened perceptibly and the worry showed in his eyes. We are all aware here of the limited opportunities available to the presidential security corps, said Commissaire Ducaret flatly. We spend our time in the immediate vicinity of the president's person. Evidently this investigation must be far more wide-ranging than my staff could undertake without neglecting its primary duties. No one contradicted him, for each department chief was aware that what the presidential security chief said was true. But neither did anyone else wish the ministerial eye to fall on him. Roger Frey looked round the table, and rested on the, the smoke-shrouded bulk of Commissaire Bouvier at the far end. What do you think, Bouvier? You have not spoken yet. The detective eased the pipe out of his mouth, managed to let a squirt of odoriferous smoke waft straight into the face of St. Clair who had turned towards him, and spoke calmly as one stating a few simple facts that had just occurred to him. It seems to me, Minister, that this dis cannot disclose this man through their agents in the OAS, since not even the OAS know who he is, that the action service cannot destroy him since they do not know who to destroy. The DST cannot pick him up at the border for they do not know whom to intercept and the RG can give us no documentary information about him because they do not know what documents to search for. The police cannot arrest him, for they do not know whom to arrest, and the CRS cannot pursue him, since they are unaware whom they are pursuing. The entire structure of the security forces of France is powerless for want of a name. It seems to me therefore that the first task, without which all other proposals become meaningless, is to give this man a name. With a name we get a face, with a face a passport, with a passport an arrest. But to find the name, and do it in secret, is a job for pure detective work. He was silent again, and inserted the stem of his pipe between his teeth. What he had said was digested by each of the men round the table. No one could fault it. Sanguinetti nodded slowly by the minister's side. And who, commissaire? is the best detective in France, asked the minister. Quietly. Bouvier considered for a few seconds, before removing his pipe again. The best detective in France, Messi yours, is my own deputy, commissaire. Claude Level. Summon him, said the minister of the interior. End of the chapter 9.